So um, without further ado, I'm looking forward to the event tonight. It's going to be a great interactive session. As we mentioned, please raise your hand. We'll get you on the podium and we'll get uh, you'll get a chance to ask as many questions as we want. We we won't we won't go anywhere until everybody's done asking and and we've got sleep gastrectomy covered. So with um, without further ado, Monique, the podium is yours. Take it from here. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Adrian, for this opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I am honored to give our first lecture. Um, let's see here. Can you guys see this? Okay. Can you guys see my slides? All right. Yes, we can, Dr. Hassan. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so as uh, Adrian uh, said, I am um, at Baylor Scott and White. Um, I'm actually in Temple, Texas, um, and I do do um, bariatric surgery. And um, just as a disclaimer, disclosure, I am 100% uh, robotic. Um, so tonight I wanted to talk to everybody about um, so some personal, some tips and tricks that I've learned pretty much about doing the sleep gastrectomy. Um, we'll talk about some technical aspects. I really do think it's really important to talk about the setup of your room, um, how to bring in the robot, those kinds of things. Um, the technique for um, the robotic sleep gastrectomy um, for most people is three, four incisions, four robotic incisions. Um, and then um, for me, I routinely actually just use three. Um, so I'll show you some videos on that. And then I'll also talk to you about some tips that I've picked up in terms of technical aspects of the specific to the robot. And then um, we'll share some outcomes. And obviously at the end, we'll take some questions. So um, for me, I think one of the most important things is um, setup. So whether it be the operating room, um, just in terms of where you have your people in the room, but also the table. This is my back table. Um, I have worked really hard to be as lean as possible. I think the leaner you can be, the faster your turnovers can be, and the more efficient your techs can be in order to help you. Um, so like I said, I routinely just do three incisions, as you can see there. I use a 12 millimeter trope car and two eight millimeter trope cars. And occasionally I will add an additional uh, eight. Um, I use the robotic camera, two of them, and then um, just usually one um, laparoscopic grasper in order to start my case. And then uh, the Carter Thompson to close my 12 millimeter incision. This is our setup for our room. Um, so this is how we have it currently. Um, we had we were really uh, we were really fortunate to have a um, really renovated room. Um, but as you can see, the robot comes in from the patient's left side, um, and um, and we have dual consoles. So the picture in the middle here is me and my resident, um, and so it's really nice. You can switch back and forth with the dual console, so it's really great for teaching. Um, and other than my really cool socks, I mean, I love these, um, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, I'm a huge fan of her. Um, but the reason I show this picture is that I really do think it's important to take your, your shoes off when you operate on the robotic console. I think it really lends its uh, ease um, to feel the pedals. And then, you know, there's a little um, kind of a lever here or step off here. And so it really helps you to feel that um, in order so that you don't hit the wrong pedal. Um, when you have your shoes on, you don't have this as much feedback. Um, so I do think it's important to do that. Um, in terms of port placement, so like I said, um, I started out doing four ports. Um, my first sleeve, I did four ports in a liver retractor. Um, my liver retractor was always on the lateral aspect of the abdomen, um, kind of in the right um, mid, mid axillary line. Um, I used the snake retractor. Um, and then, um, and then I gradually just kind of migrated to doing three incisions on the robot because I found that, you know, patients want less, right? We are a my surgeons. And if we can do it with less incisions, then why not? Um, and so I gradually migrated to just using the liver retractor and then three robotic arms. The liver retractor that I use is the snake retractor. So it does come in on the, um, on the left side of the patient, as I show, or excuse me, the right side of the patient, um, as I showed you. Um, but, um, it, um, it kind of fastens to a, um, a fast clamp, um, which is attached to the bed, much like the Nathanson. Um, obviously with the Nathanson retractor, it's more of a sub incision. Um, but, 
Whichever liver retractor you want to use, um, I think you should start out obviously using a liver retractor and then you can kind of migrate to um, without a liver retractor if you want um, and if you feel comfortable. But the tips are is that when you place this pole on the bed, it really needs to be as high up as possible. And then these kind of this this joint needs to be as close to the patient as possible so that when the robotic arms are coming in, you don't have a collision. So this is my current setup right now. I actually just do three incisions and I'll show you what I do for the liver. Um, so I do three um, robotic arms, um, one, two, and three, and I'll show you exactly what I um, what I put there. Um, but this is what it looks like. This patient's a BMI of 68. Um, and so the incisions are obviously really spread out. I do put this incision way over here, um, kind of close to the bed where you would put arm four. Um, and then if I need to add an additional port, I do have room to do that in in any case, um, if I want to add the fourth port. Um, so this is my configuration for all of my incisions. I use my hand um, in terms of my uh, measuring. So my um, kind of my wrist to my tip of my middle finger is about 12 to 15 centimeters. Um, and so I use that in terms of measurements. And then for my four incisions, I will put four incisions just um, a hand breadth apart. Um, I think that's super important that you try not to, um, you want to try and make sure that they're in a, in a straight line and make sure that you don't have have, um, so you can have your arms be as far apart as possible in terms of a fist breath apart. Um, and then here's my instrumentation. Um, I always use a bipolar or some sort of energy. So either forced bipolar um, or fenestrated bipolar in arm one. In arm two, I'm using the camera, the robotic camera. Um, and then um, in arm three, I use the vessel sealer. Um, and then in arm four, um, if I'm using arm four, I will use either the tip up um, or some people will use a cotier. Um, and then obviously for stapling, um, I will replace arm one with my stapler. Um, so this is my usual configuration minus the cotier. Um, so it's a 12 and um, two eighths or three eighths, excuse me, um, for four incisions or two eighths for three incisions. Um, the other thing that's important is, is that normally laparoscopically, we tend to put our patients really high in reverse Trendelenburg. Um, anesthesia doesn't like it. Uh, the nice thing I found about robotics is, is that we really don't need to put the patient up as high as we think. Um, so I usually use 12 degrees of reverse Trendelenburg. And this is 12. I mean, it's it looks um, it looks pretty good to me. And we, you know, you can see it on the, on the table. If you guys have the Trump table, um, you can measure and it'll actually have the degrees on there. So, um, you can actually see that it's just, it's not that high up and it's pretty impressive that you can actually still see. The other thing too, is once I put my robotic ports in, um, I actually will pre-close my um, 12 millimeter port with the Carter Thompson, as I showed you. And then also um, because I don't use a regular liver retractor, I normally just use um, a, um, a internal liver retractor. I put that suture in um, before um, I dock my robot. So I bring the robot in from the patient. I showed you from the patient left. Um, and then I, once I dock the robot, I get in. Um, and then I do this for my liver retraction. Um, so I place a, a suture, um, a pass. And this is a Stratifix. And I was playing with Stratifix versus VLOC. Um, I do like VLOC a little bit better. Um, the barbs are not as aggressive. Um, and as you can see, you have a pretty good hold on the liver. You have good exposure for your, uh, this patient had a hiatal hernia. So you have pretty good exposure for that. Um, every liver is a little bit different. So you might have to play with it in order to get it in the right position. But I like using this. Um, it's one, it saves me one less incision. If I am using four incisions, it's usually because the patient has a hiatal hernia. And this is my standard dissection. So again, I'm probably a little bit different than most people. Um, I do start and go more distal first. Um, so I want to get all my distal adhesions um, kind of mobilized as far down as possible. I do put a 40 French uh, Visigy in the patient's um, um, stomach before I get started. Um, that's placed by anesthesia. And I go retrogastric. And as you can see here, I'm taking down all the adhesions post and I mobilize the fundus from the back. Um, and I find that this works on almost 
all of my patients. Um, I've not really had a whole lot of um, issues in terms of doing this visual, this dissection. And this is my resident doing the dissection, but you can see we got a nice wide mobilization of the fundus up high. And this can be the hardest part most of the time in terms of sleeve. Um, and you and you can actually mobilize this pretty far down in order to even, um, you can even see if there's a hiatal hernia. And this patient had already had a hiatal hernia, so we dissected that out. And then now you just, I use my tip up to extend out the, um, the omentum. And then, um, then we just go straight down. Um, and it makes the dissection pretty easy and pretty smooth. Um, and I also do think that this is pretty reproducible in terms of, um, that. Um, I did forget to mention that I do put a Raytech in, in the beginning, because, you know, if I need to stop up any bleeding or anything like that, um, I already have that there. Um, and then, um, and then I can use if with four arms, I can use, um, I can have my resident or whoever, um, if it's just me, I can, um, you know, I can retract for myself. I mobilize the fat pad, um, uh, to make sure that I have, um, adequate, uh, visualization of the angle of his for stapling. Um, and so this is my final completion of my dissection over, um, the angle of his, and I I'm using that ray tech in case I need it for any bleeding, just to mobilize my angle of his, make sure that I have, I usually have a target for my stapler. So that's my dissection with four arms. Um, with three arms, I, I retract all for myself. Um, so as you can see, again, I start down distal, mobilize everything. And I just lift up on that, on that bougie that's already in the stomach. And I use that as my traction. And once I have a good window, and as you can see, this is a pretty nice window. This patient's a little bit thin on the inside. Um, and you can just, again, you can just march right up the greater curve really easily once you have that mobilization. If you have a really floppy stomach, you can take that ray tech and stuff, stuff it down in the lesser sac, and that will also help you with um, mobilization for the three arms. Um, um, and I, I like this. Um, I like this approach because I just think it's really, it's fun and makes it a little bit different. Um, it allows good exposure for my um my uh, dissection. Um, the only time I don't really like just using three arms is if the patient has a hiatal hernia. Um, I do like to put a tip up in in order to expose um, the retrosophageal window. Um, and then this is my forearm, forearms for stapling. So um, for stapling, it's pretty straightforward. I use a 40 French vis visage. I tend to stay pretty close to the visage. The first two fires, um, I, you know, angle more, my stapler more out towards the spleen. Um, I start pretty aggressively with a blue load. I don't use any reinforcements. Um, and then after that, I, pr I pretty aggressively downsize. And as you can see, I'm going to a white load. Um, I think that um, the the thinner the load that you can use, um, the staple height, um, the less bleeding you tend to have. Um, and I haven't had any issues with that. Um, and I do like on the, uh, with the tip up, I can, you know, I can extend out the stomach, that fundus a little bit more. Um, it gives me a little bit more, um, ability to get closer to the visage up at the top. Um, and if the liver's hanging down a little, I can use the tip up um, for additional exposure. Um, but my stapling is, is pretty straightforward. Um, I don't have to manipulate the stomach too much. Um, I think we try to manipulate it a, a little bit too much, I think, in uh, when we're doing it um, laparoscopically. Um, so this is my last fire. I check the angle of his, make sure I'm um, good. Um, and I've got a good um, uh, cuff of tissue um, off of the angle of his. With my my uh, three arms, um, again, I start the same. Um, I listen to the stapler usually. So as long as it fires and there's not too many pauses um, on um, on it, then I will use, um, you know, I will upsize to a blue if, if there were so many pauses on the first one um, or if it doesn't want to fire, then I usually will tend to upsize, of course. Um, but I pretty consistently will use at least one blue and then um, multiple whites. On the three arms, I tend to um, I tend to shift um, the stapler over to the left a little bit. I want to really hug the visage because I don't have a whole lot. I don't have two arms for traction, and then the top um, uh, part of the sleeve stapling is pretty again straightforward. I um, can retract out for myself using the vessel sealer, um, and that's my three arm technique for stapling. 
Um, for leak test, um, I don't scope. I just use ICG, um, especially since I already have my um, my Visigy already in place. So I have the anesthesia mix up um, the ICG and reconstitute that in 500 cc's of saline and administer 60 cc's down the Visigy. Um, and then I usually have them will have that followed by 60 cc's of air to really in, in, inflate the sleeve. And as you can see here, it's pretty good. Um, there's a certain feature on the newer um, scopes that um, show the sensitive mode. Um, and you can see pretty clearly that there's no ICG outside of the stomach. Um, and so that's a negative leak test. Um, there are a lot of people that don't do leak tests. Um, and every time I think about not doing a leak test, I have something like this. And so this is a, a sleeve that I did. I usually have them pull back the Visigy and this, you know, initially it looks okay. It lights up just fine. Um, and then I have them put some air down and then I'm looking up there, a little sensitive mode. I come up and then I notice this little thing up here and I'm like, huh, that's interesting. I don't know what that is. And then I get a peek up at the top and I'm like, oh, there's something up here. And so then I zoom in a little bit more. And then what do you know? There's ICG outside of the stomach. Um, there was on this staple fires um, up there, there was no issues, no problems. It was my usual white load. Um, but clearly to me, this is a positive leak test as you can see here. So in this patient, I ended up having to over sew that um, entire staple line um, just to make sure. And then the nice thing about ICG is you can retest right away. Um, so, um, the other thing I think that people worry about a lot is, um, sleeves are pretty straightforward cases and, you know, and the cost of robotics can be, um, a factor. Um, I actually ran all of my costs before I even started just to make sure. So I could see which instruments I should use, um, just to price everything out and what I, what I should use. Um, and I found out that I was actually a little bit ahead when I was doing a three, um, three incision sleeve, um, with a vessel sealer extend. Um, and I found that to be pretty significant and I was able to bring that to my administration um, and that I use that um, along with some um, literature that actually Dr. Elchar had um, published that demonstrated that, you know, the cost is not so bad. Um, and then the other thing that um, I, all, people always talk about too is time. Um, you know, we have this um, application on, in the palm of our hands. It's called the My Intuitive app, and it shows you um, your data, right? So here are my, here are all my sleeves, and these are the lowest console times that I've had. So 24, 25 minutes. Um, I think that's not too bad for um, for me being in a teaching institution, letting my residents do cases. Um, um, so that's not bad in terms of time. And then the other nice thing about teaching is, is that I can look back and I can see what my instrument exchanges have been, what instruments I use. Um, and then I can look at my reliably, my staple fires. Um, and then look, my leak test is only 38 seconds. Um, that's pretty good. I mean, I don't think you can get up and around the table to scope in 38 seconds. Um, and then the other nice thing is, is that I can use it as a teaching tool. So here I am going along um, uh, doing the case and I can show my resident okay, here is, um, you know, the times that you had these arms, these are the times it took to fire. If there were pauses or any issues in terms of that, we can review the case timeline and the data. It's pretty great to have so, so much of this information. Um, so some technical tips, like I said, um, so I use that 40 French Visigy as a bougie, and then I also use it as a, you know, mark for my leak test. Um, I do mark out all of my incisions. And so if I do need to put a fourth incision, um, then um, it's always there. Um, I do use the retrogastric dissection approach. I can take down all those adhesions. I don't have to flip back and forth. I think it makes it pretty efficient in terms of the actual procedure. Um, I do think it's important to take down that fat pad to make sure that there's no hiatal hernia. Um, I do think that it's important to downsize that staple height as soon as possible. Um, I think the higher the staple height, the more bleeding that you're going to get. Um, and the leak test with ICG is pretty reliable, as I showed you.
Um, in terms of my outcomes, um, once I went from lap to robot, um, I actually stopped prescribing as many pain medications. We actually were able to um, decrease the amount of pain medications we prescribed by half. And we're actually thinking about stopping uh, prescribing any tramadol for any of our patients um, and just giving just Celebrex and Tylenol as their post-operative discharge meds. Um, we do same day discharge. So patient comes in that morning, goes home later on that afternoon with about um, um, four hours um, total in their stay. Um, and we've had low readmissions and low, DE, low ER visits. Um, and as a consequence, we've had high patient satisfaction scores due to less incisions. And then obviously, um, I wouldn't continue doing this if I had a lot of complications and I've had no uh, knock on wood, no um, leaks um, for my slaves. So with that, I'll take any questions. Um, I'll stop share here. So. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for that really excellent talk. I learned a lot. Um, and Ishna from Mayo, Rochester. Um, uh, question about the placement of arm four. So mm -hmm. it looked like that would be between arms or at least incisions for two and three. So do you then stop and switch over the arms as well? Or do you kind of, how do you bring arm four in for if it's in between two and three, I guess. Oh, you're saying if, so if I have to add in the inc uh, incision. So what I do is I actually, um, so I plan all of my, so I have all my patients scoped beforehand. So I usually will know ahead of time if they have a hiatal hernia. So if they have one, then I'll put four in. Um, if I don't know that I, that they have one, then what I do is I have my resident stand at the bedside and I place my arm for incision um, out lateral as possible. My arm three incisions already marked. And so then I dock arm, my arm three, what would be arm three. And then I would, you know, then I get on the console, look under the liver, do my liver retraction stitch and say, oh yeah, there's a hiatal hernia. Okay. We can add, uh, an additional arm, um, uh, eight millimeter port. Um, and then yes, then he does take that arm three or she takes that arm three and moves it to, to that arm three. And then we bring in arm four. So all the arms are draped and sterile. So. Good question. The other thing I forgot to mention too, is that um, I don't, um, I varus at where my arm two would be. Um, so in all of my patients bypass sleeve, um, I opted, I, I varus there where the arm two is. So I don't have to add an extra incision. And then I opt to view where my arm one is with a regular 12 Covidian port and then swap that out to the robotic port. Well, hopefully we'll see some more hands up Great question, but I got one, Monique. Yeah. Um, I'm really intrigued by the that three point uh, stitch, the barb mm -hmm. stitch, because I find that incision to be one of the most morbid incisions. Patients always complain of of pain as it rubs against the 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 ribs and the cartilage. Take mm -hmm. me through that. You know, it's kind of fast. I know that's not sped up. That's your regular speed that you operate. On. <laughs> yeah. So I usually, so in that video, that's the, that was a Stratafix, but usually I now have migrated away from Stratafix and I now use VLOC. So I use the VLOC um, and I, I, I actually use my arm one as almost my retractor initially. So I go in and I lift up on the liver and I see where the liver wants to lay up along the anterior abdominal wall. So then once I kind of see where it's going to, where it would be a good spot for it, then what I do is I pass the, um, the needle on the on the left side of the falciform. Uh, then, so I lock my V-lock there and then I go down and actually most of the time in that patient here, she had a hiatal hernia and was pretty smaller left lobe. So I actually will put an um, incision through the anterior uh, or the superior aspect of the hiatus. Um, so right almost smack in the middle. Um, and it has to be a really superficial incision. So um, I've heard stories of people getting um, or seeing or having patients with tampon on from this specific stitch. So you really want to be as, as um, kind of shallow as possible. And then you, and then usually it requires two, if they have a really big left lobe, then it requires two, two passes. So one pass there, and then you go over kind of towards the cruise, um, towards kind of the IVC danger zone, but you, there's a band there. And then you can just, again, another superficial bite right there, and then pull it back 
And then I usually will pull my arm one out um, and then drop down the liver and then pull the stitch. And then I pass it on the other side of falciform. Now, if it, they have a really big chunky falciform, I will sometimes just go through the falciform so that it's out of my way. So I don't keep hitting it with the, um, the when the stapler comes in, I don't have to worry about that. Um, and then I pass it right there on the, on the other side of the falciform and I pull up and then you know, in Texas, we have a lot of big livers. So then sometimes I'll have to pull it back um, and pull the stitch back and kind of anchor it more like where I went into in, in first, um, where I put my first pass. So it's all it's I think everybody when when um, I first started doing it, I think um, it, it's a lot of trial and error. There's no I don't think there's an exact science to it. Um, there's a little bit of art to it. You have to really kind of just lift up the liver, see where the liver wants to lay. Um, and it works for, I mean, I've been using it for almost two years. We keep pulling up the liver retractor and then we keep having to put it away because I end up using the, just the liver stitch. Thank you. Great explanation. I'll try that on my next sleeve. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. Let's see other, if there's any questions, just go ahead and speak up. Uh, I have a question actually. Uh, John Perron out of uh, St. Luke's. Thank you very much, Dr. Sauter, for the excellent uh, presentation. Um, can you just talk about uh, your thought process and experience on how you came to arrive at the one blue load and then white load uh, staples all the way up? Um, you know, was yeah. it trial and error? Um, you know. Yeah, so it was trial and error. Um, you know, the other thing I think um, that's really important with robotics is there's a huge community of robotic surgeons, specifically on Facebook, um, also on Surgeon, um, the the app actually tomorrow we're doing, this is just a sheer plug for our, um, we're doing masterclass tomorrow on gastric bypass, but, um, but anyway, um, but it's watching a lot of other people's videos, right? Um, so I don't think I had the courage to even try the, uh, that liver stitch if I hadn't seen somebody else do it, right? And then um, and then with the, with the staple heights, um, I have found, so I used a green load initially, my very, very first one, I used a green load, um, and it bled like crazy because I wasn't using staple line reinforcement. And I was like, this is crazy. And then I went to blue, um, and then it was a little bit better, but yeah, I still had to spend time, like just pinpointing on the staple line. So I was like, this is crazy. This is taking me 20 minutes to do this, to clean up the staple line. Um, and so then, um, in talking with some other people, I was like, well, if it, obviously the stapler is a quote unquote smart stapler, right? So if it clamps, it should fire, right? And the tissues, it's reading all this data that, you know, that is way beyond me. Um, but if it works, if it clamps, then it should fire. Um, so I started using uh, blue on the first one and then blue on the second one. And then I was like a little bit more bleeding on the second blue. So I was like, okay, well, let's try white. And then it started from there. Um, and then really, honestly, when I do gastric bypass, I use all white loads and it's that part of the stomach anyway, right? So it just intuitively made sense that, oh, well, maybe I should just use all white loads. Um, so, so that's kind of how I've gotten, and I'm, I'm a consistent person, so I don't like to mix things up. Oh yeah, let's get this color. Let's get, I like to kind of keep things the same every time. So I've been pretty consistent with one blue and then the rest whites. Um, and then my tech will be like, oh, let's just bring one more blue in the room just in case the second blue doesn't want to clamp on that white. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I've been doing. And I haven't had any increase in bleeds. I don't, I don't, oh, and you can see, I don't over, so the staple line, the, the staple line pr looks pretty hemostatic on most of my cases. Um, I've had, since I've been robotic, I've had, um, two patients bleed, um, but none that required going back to the OR. And I had the same number of bleeds using staple line reinforcement when I was lap. So I was like, well, I mean, that's kind of the same. <laughs> so. Going off of that question on the staple loads, are you doing a uh, much band sleeve and are you noticing that you're still getting away with the white loads or you need to upsize those? Yeah. So I fundamentally have a problem with, with going from band to sleeve. That's just me personally. I just don't think, I think if you're going from one restriction to another restriction, you're going to fail. 
Um, and so I don't, I don't even offer that. Um, if you had a band, you're getting a bypass. So. Monique, I've got a question for you. Speaking of the days when we did bands and um, <laughs> I, uh, Monique and I did the same fellowship and I remember doing some of the, you know, a few years before you I got quite a few years on you, but just, I just remember, one or two. <laughs> no, more than that. But I remember doing some of the first sleeves that we did. And I can tell you the sleeve that we did back then is not the sleeve that we do today. Mm -hmm. I believe one of the most important principles is uh, the full dissection of the fundus mm -hmm. is enough. How far do you go? When do you know that you've dissected enough fundus to make sure that you do a, an appropriate operation? Yeah. So for me, I, I insist on rolling over my, my stomach and seeing the cruise. Um, if I don't see the cruise and I'm probably the most anal when it comes to all of that, but I have to have a good view of that. And I dissect it out completely to make sure that yes, we're adequately there. Um, and if I have any hint of potentially that this is a hiatal hernia, I am super aggressive and I will just dissect out the hiatus just to make sure that I'm, I'm all the way there. Um, and as you can see on the video, I do die. I do Sorry. Okay. pretty aggressively. Dissect so, okay. Out. So gastric bypass G tube. Oh, Shana, your mic is on. Um, oh. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I, um, um, I'm pretty aggressive at dissecting out the fat pad so that I can ensure that that's not a, not an issue. Well, everybody else is thinking of questions. I have one for you, Dr. Hassan. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we see a wide range of patients now that we're um, doing robotic surgery on. Can you comment on like how you change your port placement, if at all, when you're doing some of the smaller patients? Because I've found that sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to get that 10 to 12 centimeters between the port sites. Yeah. So, um, so again, I, I try not to change my port sites, um, as much. I, my OR staff knows that I'm, I'm always like, oh my gosh, these small patients make me the most nervous. Um, but, um, but I try to make sure that whatever I have in terms of once I'm placing my ports, it's at least two to three centimeters apart on the inside. Um, so even though I mark my ports out, um, as I showed you, um, it works 99% of the time, um, as long as you can have two to three centimeters apart on the inside. Um, so the nice thing about a bigger patient is you have, you can go completely a hand breath away um, and be fine. Um, and then the other thing too, is that, you know, my arm four, sometimes it's at, like at the white line of tilt, especially in a thinner patient. I mean, it's far down there because I really don't want to be colliding between arm three and four. Um, and usually in the, the smaller patients, I'm doing like some sort of revision, right? So, um, so in those patients, you know, you need as much, you need to maximize your space as possible in between the robotic arms. So it is, it, it can be far out there, but as long as you're not in the colon and you can put it on, you know, do it on, um, um, actual visualization. And I think, um, it usually works out fine. Um, and, you know, and I think that everybody needs to get rid of thinking about the umbilicus as your, your measure, um, above and below the umbilicus. I think it depends on just where it ends up. Like it's not going to always be above the umbilicus. Um, it can sometimes just be below the umbilicus and that's your 12 centimeters away. So. Monica, um, uh, oh, no, Debbie goes first. No, no, you go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. The session is for you guys, not for us. Yeah, go ahead, Debbie. So uh, I had two questions. One is about your leak test, because I've <laughs> never actually heard about doing ICG as a leak test. I think that's really cool. And obviously it speeds up your OR time um, and it's efficient. So I wanted to know how you came to that. Uh -huh. um, and then also in terms of, of that measuring, do you measure after you've insulated the patient? So you put in your varus, you insulate, and then you measure, or is that even really a part of things? It seems like you mark out even before you um, kind uh, of measure what measure where I'm uh, gonna... just, just mm -hmm, like where you're going to put your ports. Cause you know, we, we're, if you're not using um, so in my program, we'll measure from the, the xiphoid process or, you know, kind of where the, um, 
ribs come together and uh -huh. say, okay, distance for our sleeve is going to be about 15, 16 centimeters. And then we'll mark out our ports from there. Right. Um, but there tends to be a lot of variability once you insufflate and correct your ports yeah, are so, too low. Right. And, yeah. Absolutely. So I totally agree. I definitely will. Um, I mark out everything before I start. Um, so I put my Varus in, um, I mark all my ports and those are usually my parts, my ports. I may cheat like one or two centimeters above or below, just depending on where things end up. But like I said, I Varus, um, where I'm going to put my camera. So that usually commits me 99.99% of the time. Um, and I'm like, all right, well, that's where it's going to go. Um, if it's too low, um, that's okay because the robotic like the robotic camera is really long. So it's not usually an issue. Um, only issue I've had every once in a while is that sometimes when you're trying to get to the fundus um, and above to, to dissect out um, that cruise, you can have a little bit of issue um, getting up there, but then you can just burp the port in and then that gives you the extra centimeters that you need. Um, so I don't, I, so yeah, so I mark, mark that out and I keep it that way. Um, and then for icy green, I came to that because um, actually my proctor who um, proctored me for robotics, he mentioned it to me. Um, and I was like, no, 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 I'm going to scope. This is, I mean, I, we scope everybody. I mean, I'm just going to do that. And it doesn't add much time to the case. Like, what are you talking about? And then we shut down for COVID. And um, they said you couldn't do um, endoscopy unless everybody in the room was like, you know, N95 up and the whole nine yards. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, we got to move through these cases. Um, and um, and so I stopped doing it. Um, and I was like, all right, well, let's try IC Green. And and I was legit amazed at one how fast it was to do the leak test with IC Green versus you know, endoscopy, because I, again, was convinced that it really only added five minutes to the case, but it turned out it was adding at least 15 minutes to the case, because as you know, you're standing at the bedside or you're standing at the, you're sitting at the console and you're like, oh, okay, are we ready? And then you, you know, you get over there, the scope's not on, it's not plugged in, there's no buttons, all of the things. Um, so, um, so yeah, so it was really kind of revolutionary for that. Um, but then I started doing a lot more research in terms of IC green, and obviously we use it for biliary, um, but it's cost is cheaper. My partner actually uses methylene blue. Um, and so the cost is cheaper. Um, and then I also found that, um, that it's more reliable than methylene blue when you look at the literature. So I was like, well, I mean, I would rather something that's hypersensitive than not. So, so that, that's how I started using it. Monique, I have a quick question for you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so um, I don't actually, uh, just a quick comment. I don't do um, drop endoscopy uh, on sleep patients anymore. I don't do ICG uh, either. Uh, I stopped doing that. Uh, um, and we haven't had an issue, but I also implicate the state line on every single case. My question for you, though, uh, was about omentopexy. Can you mm -hmm. comment for the fellows on uh, the omentopexy? Do you do an omentopexy? Do you not? Uh, mm -hmm. um, and whether there's data either uh, either way. I, I know I'm very selective after mm -hmm. I take the bougie out. If a, a, I like the way the sleeve looks, uh, I, I may not do an omentopexy. If I get that gentle curve around the caesura, I may not do an omentopexy. But if I take the bougie out and I feel like the, uh, the sleeve is not straight or it's uh, uh, turning kind of like clockwise or kind of clockwise, right. I don't get that gentle curve around the caesura, I may do one or two uh, omentopexy stitches. What's yeah. your take on omentopexy? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I trained at the Cleveland Clinic and first of all, we called it the shower cap. Um, for uh, for the the actual um, momentum over the sleeve, um, but I actually I don't do it. Um, I only do an omentopexy, um, and the the I've tried it one time. Um, I let my um, resident, a junior resident, fire the first two fires on the staple uh, on the sleeve, and it just came out just kind of wonky. And I was like. Mm. So we try to do this omentopexy to try and like pull down the stomach for this gentle curve and the whole nine yards. And she just did not fly. And at eight weeks, we had to convert her to a bypass because she just nausea vomiting. She, I mean, her insidura was narrow. 
Um, so I, I don't do it. Um, I find that as long as I'm far enough away that I find that my curve is good. Um, and so I don't, I, I only train to just put the momentum over the sleeve. Um, because if you're going to go back for a revision, it'll be nice to just plow through the momentum. You don't have to worry about it sticking like the sleeve sticking to the stomach. I mean, to the liver, um, but, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't do it. I do do a, a mental patch when I do bypass. Um, and, um, and I just cover my GJ anastomosis with some momentum and I just call it day and that's it. So I do minimal as possible. So how far from the pylorus do you start your staple line and what's the rationale? So I don't measure, um, so I probably start probably closer than most people probably. Um, I probably start somewhere around three, maybe four centimeters um, to the pylorus, but I really have the visage in place to kind of guide how the sleeve is going to look. So for me, it's uh, the visage sucks down really nicely and it poses the anterior and posterior layer. I mean, uh, walls of the stomach. And so I find that as long as it's a nice gentle curve. And I'm happy with the way that it looks like it's off, you know, I, that's why I dissect down as far as possible. And then it, and then I kind of just take a gentle curve along, um, along that visage and I stay out a little bit, maybe one or two centimeters, um, on the distal aspect, my first two fires, but then after that, I'm as close as possible. I, I hug. Um, so I don't measure, um, it, cause I feel like everybody's stomach is different. And if you try to, you know, apply the same principles in every patient, I just don't think that that's going to work. I mean, I think that surgery is technical to some aspects, but then there's an art to surgery and that's, you know, figuring out that gentle curve, that angle and how it's going to look once you're done. So. Monica, you presented uh, your liver retraction technique. Do you ever not use liver retraction? I find that the, unless the patient has a had a hernia, I don't typically use any liver retraction because depending on how you retract the stomach, you can at the same time retract the, the liver as well and it stays out of the way. Absolutely. Um, there's a handful of times where I've gotten in, I'm like, oh man, they did great on their liver shrinking diet. So I don't really need anything. Sometimes I'll just put a gauze over um, and it'll just be able to hold the liver over. Um, I've had people who've had just plenty of enough of adhesions <laughs> that it holds up the liver. So it's fine. Um, but yeah, there, there are a handful of times. It's not usually, uh, like I said, I'm in Texas. So all these livers are really big. Um, so it's, it's only been a handful of times where I've not had to use anything. Monique, I feel like we have to talk a little bit about that um, posterior dissection prior to taking down the shorties. Sure. I think a lot of times we try to, to uh, translate what we do laparoscopically to robotics, and clearly it's not always the case. Mm -hmm. I, I was kind of intrigued by that. I think I'm definitely going to try it. Can you tell us a little more about how that came about to be, how you introduced that, how you transitioned from laparoscopic to uh, the conventional laparoscopic to, to this technique? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I found that, um, I was one of my, one of my first robotic cases was a patient who had a BMI of like 60 something. Um, and so, um, again, my proctor, he was like, well, you can come from the backside. Um, and I was like, well, okay, but that's not how I do it. I do this like, like lateral laparoscopically. Um, and we were just fighting with all of that you know, momentum that's up in the left upper quadrant and trying to pull it down and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, so yeah, I, um, I started going posterior, um, and I did find, um, that holding up the visage, um, once you're in that lesser sac helps to also give you an additional retraction of the liver if you need it too. Um, and so I found that it was just a great idea. Now, he also had suggested I take a ray tech and shove it up there in order to help make the window bigger and all that other stuff. I don't do that. Um, it just, it gets in the way and it just, you know, it's confusing for the residents. And um, so, and I actually just found that I like just doing something different. Um, I think that that's why I adopted the robot. Um, I, I think if I could just do my exact same laparoscopic technique, then then the robot wouldn't really have an advantage for me. Um, you know, it's just doing the same thing, just with a different platform. Um, so for me, I think 
it's, it's cool to do something different. Um, and so I started doing it and then started working on, on 99.99% of the patients. Um, it works really well. Um, obviously you can see on thin patients, it works really great. Um, but on the bigger patients, it actually works really nice. Cause then you can stay away from all of that stuff at, that's out lateral. Um, and also I find that it keeps my residents out of the spleen. Like we barely even see it. You see a little tiny hint of it and then you're like, Oh, okay, there it is. And then you, you know, and then you go out lateral. Um, so it's really, um, that's how I came to start using it. Um, I'm kind of a off the beaten path type person. So <laughs> that's why. Other questions? If not, I've got plenty. I had a question. Um, you talked about the My Intuitive app, which uh, you know logs our data, uh, which I think is great, and uh, uh, you know to drive data-driven surgery. Um, have you looked at the data in terms of OR time for your three-arm technique versus your forearm? Yeah, so my three-arm technique is much faster. So 90% of those small, like those shorter cases, like 24 minutes, 23 minutes, those are all three-arm sleeves. Um, my forearm sleeve, and I, I mean, I, I, I hate to say that, but my forearm, I, I usually will let the resident do much more. So then the time is a lot longer. So I feel like the data is a little bit skewed, but, um, but yeah, my three arm is definitely much, much faster than my forearm. Speaking, uh, Monique, speaking of things that we try to translate from laparoscopy, um, after hearing your, um, your experience, I think I'm going to I'm going to tone down the, the angle at which I put my patients. I start at 12. Yeah. I go all the way to 22, 23. What? Yeah. Am I doing too much? I, I'm with you. I'm with you, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> am I, I doing too much? Am I too low with my, with my, because I feel like I, it's helping me, but maybe it doesn't. Maybe I'll. I, I'll I think honestly, you'd be surprised. You probably wouldn't even notice if they put it at 15. You know, you probably wouldn't. Yet. I mean, I think it's, again, I think it's something that we always do. And so I think it makes you think that it's better, but I think right. if you try it, then you'll be like, oh, I mean, I, the, the, the view is no different, you know? Yeah. I certainly I agree with Dr. Son. I do uh, 15 degrees myself now. And actually I've translated it because I still do laparoscopy. And so I've translated it to laparoscopically and I just set to 15 degrees now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, from a, I think from a obviously from a incisional standpoint, it's minimally invasive surgery. From a physiologic standpoint, it's maximally um, disruptive to the patient's physiology. And when you have more reverse from Dahlenberg, I bet you it does make a difference. So I'll definitely take a, a page from you and, and Shana's book and try to do less reverse from Dahlenberg. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times I will even just do twelve, and then you know, and then. Sometimes I'm like, oh, it's kind of big. Let's do 15. Yeah, you know, but if it's somewhere in between 12 and 15, I'm usually fine. I mean, it's, it, there's really probably no difference. <laughs> so. Well, we've got about five minutes left, guys. So I want to ask some of the other faculty if they have questions for Monique or if they have any other um, pearls that they want to add. Well, there's one thing I had wanted Dr. Hassan to kind of touch on. Um, you know, I find more and more I'm talking with my colleagues about switching from laparoscopic to doing robotic cases. And I think there's much trepidation because most of us are trained laparoscopically. And I know you went through this whole transition yourself. Like, mm -hmm. What was it like when you're doing the actual first cases as an attending and, you know, like emotionally, psychologically, whatever term you want to use, like, how did you handle that transition? Because basically the book stops with you. And if you're kind of doing something in the, the OR, there's nobody to really help you out. Yeah, actually, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I the night before I um start made the transition, um, I did not sleep. <laughs> um, it was really stressful. Um, and I also was kind of a jump in the deep end of the pool. So like my first couple of patients were like. 45 BMI, 65 BMI. I mean, I was like crazy, right? Um, and so 
for me, there's nobody in my hospital that does bariatrics um, robotically. Um, and I did have a good proctor. Um, but honestly, my proctor was, um, he was hard. Um, he was like, I'm not here to um, hold your hand through the case necessarily, because you're a good laparoscopic surgeon. But he was like, I'm going to push you in to try different things. Um, so, um, you know, one of the things he pushed me to try was OptiViewing in no pneumo. And I was like, oh, I can't handle that. Like, I was like, I just, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. Um, and so I was like, I just don't want to put myself in a situation where I'm trying something new, create issues. Um, and then I had a long chat also with my resident that day, right? Because they scrub in and they're like, oh my God, we're doing a robotic case. And, you know, they have this idea that they're going to be able to do stuff. And I'm like, I'm sorry, you're just not going to be able to do anything because I'm in my learning curve. But it was really stressful. Um, I think that you have to think back in your mind that, you know, at the end of the day, you can always convert this patient to lap right? So if the robotic platform, you can't see anything, you can't do it, um, or whatever, then you can convert to lap, right? Just always remember that the robotic trocars are in one straight line lap, you have to triangulate. So you have to remember that. Um, and so you might have to add more ports, right? Um, but it is really stressful. And I think it's just like, you know, that first time you cross the road by yourself, you just have to be like, okay, I'm just going to do it. Like I, you know, and hopefully I don't get hit by a car <laughs> along the way. So, um, so yeah. Um, and then obviously there's a lot of mentorship, you know, there's programs like this, obviously you guys will have my information, my phone number, email, so you can always reach out, um, before a case, during a case. Um, I've had that happen. I had a crazy Nissan takedown that, uh, Matt Foreman was happened to be in Dallas for an inter, like a talk or something. And I FaceTimed him. I was like, dude, I'm on the robotic popcorn. I've been here licensing adhesions for three hours. Like, what am I going to do here? And he's like, yeah, that looks fine to me. Like, it's just, it is what it is. And I was like, oh, okay, keep going, you know? Um, so, so I think just having somebody to call too is really important. Um, that phone a friend. Um, so, yeah. Wonderful. Last chance for a question. We're coming up on the hour here. Dr. Hassan, um, for your same day discharges, do you have a certain protocol you use? Uh, in, in our institution, we're 100% robotic as well. Um, both of our attendings keep patients for sleeve uh, up until post-op day one, kind of like oh. 12 noon, early afternoon. So I kind of want to like talk to our team and see if we can make some changes in our protocols and our standards. Yeah, so we, everybody gets EMEND pre-op. Um, so they have to purchase that. Um, it's an uh, one pill um, and we give 80 milligrams. So we have had minimal um, post-op nausea. Um, in our day surgery, we're actually really, I mean, we're tough. We tell them that, you know, they'll go back to day surgery and the day surgery rooms don't even have beds. They just have chairs. <laughs> so they have to drink, they have to walk. Um, we have an, we have an inpatient nurse, um, that goes, you know, sees them pre-op and then walks around with them post-op and just reinforces everything. We have a protocol in terms of our actual diet post-op. Um, so in the hospital, they, um, start out with like 15 cc's every 30 minutes, and then they progress and it's just water. And then they progress to 30 cc's every 15 minutes. And as long as they can do that over, you know, four hours um, and walk and their pain's okay, then they can go home. We would, we were keeping patients for, um, you know, waiting till they peed, but I'm like, this is like a gallbladder guys. Like we don't wait till gallbladder patients pee. So um, we trialed it. We had no patients with urinary retention or anything like that coming back to the ER. So we just did a small subset and then we were like, all right, nobody's, nobody's struggling with that. So there you go. Um, so, and then I usually will do Tiva anesthesia. I have anesthesia Duke Tiva. Um, Aurora Pryor wrote a paper talking about same day discharges for uh, bariatric surgery. And that was one of the key things. And, um, Stacy Brethauer published that energy trial. And that was one of the things. Um, and then, um, and then yeah, scope patch, all of the anti-emetics in-house, um, and they get that post-op. And then we have an ability to call them the next day. 
um, to make sure that they're doing okay. Um, check their heart rate, blood pressure, all of that stuff. Um, so it's almost like they're, you know, in the hospital, except they're at home. So. Well, thank you all. We're coming up on the hour here. Um, I want to congratulate all of you again for being selected. Um, I hope you take advantage of this great opportunity. We had quite a bit of um, quite a bit of demand for the program, more than we expected, and and we're happy that we're able to get um, a nice group like you guys to uh, to get this started. <clears throat> and it looks like Dimitri has his hand up or clap. You're clapping. Is that what you're doing? Sorry. <laughs> But thank you all again for joining us, and we look forward to the next session. Obviously, we look forward to meeting you all guys, all you guys in person in Atlanta in um, January 4th. Yeah. So reach out to Morgan if you have any questions, and thank you all for joining.